go ahead and start this lesson off with um, just a prayer from the Oratory Place of Prayer book. And this is going to be on page 15 of that book. It's the um, picture with St. Michael, the Archangel. Uh, this prayer is called Protect Us, O Lord. And it's a beautiful prayer that we actually uh, start off at night prayer, um, which is part of the Gospel Canticle. This is a great prayer um, to just say, um, you know, before you go to bed, maybe even with your children. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Protect us, Lord, as we stay awake. Watch over us as we sleep, that awake we may keep watch with Christ, and asleep rest in His peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Uh, this lesson is on... Um, is, is taken from Mark's Gospel, Mark uh, 1, 21 through 28. And uh, this is one of those instances when we see Jesus um, not just healing a physical uh, ailment, um, let's say paralysis or, or uh, having the, the, you know, the deaf hear, but this is a chance, this is actually a time where we see him driving out a demon, someone that is possessed with a demon, and he's, he, through the authority that he has as God, drives out the demon. So this is a reading according to Mark. Then they came to Capernaum, and on the Sabbath Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. The people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. In their synagogue was a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him and said, Quiet, come out of him. The unclean spirit convulsed him, and with a loud cry came out of him. All were amazed and asked one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. His fame, his fame spread everywhere throughout the whole region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so there's a few things here that we can um, really focus on. Um, one is the, the words of this demon. Um, and how, how did this demon know that uh, Jesus was God, that he is the Holy One of God? Um, so we have to remember that this, this reading, which is in, in the first chapter of Mark, um, actually comes after the temptation in the desert. So we know, and even the church fathers say this, that um, after the temptation in the desert, um, we, Satan definitely knows that Jesus is the Son of God. He, um, Jesus was, was put through the temptations and he passes. Um, and so Satan now has his marked man, um, the person that he will seek to destroy. And so the demons, of course, also as well would know this. And this is what is, was happening in Mark's Gospel. Interesting enough that this is the first, uh, the demon is the first to acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God, um, except for, um, we already hear that, that uh, the apostles, some of the first apostles, Peter and Andrew and James and John, who have already, you know, of course, professed this and believe that this is the Messiah. So, one of the first in the gospel to recognize Jesus as Son of God is actually a demon. Um, and, and we see this, um, you know, in this gospel, and then the demon has to obey the authority of Jesus because Jesus is God and God has power over the demons. That's one thing I think it's important to realize as Catholics we don't believe in a dualism. Um, what I mean by dualism is that uh, we have Satan here and God here and that they're equal in power, kind of like a, a yin-yang where, um, where they have equal power. Um, we know that, that Satan um, was created by God and so we have Lucifer. Lucifer, the angel of light, was created by God, and then he chose to fall. Him and a third of the angels, those angels are now demons. And so they are lower than God, and when God speaks, um, they have to obey. Um, so before this lesson, we are going to get into a little bit of um, demonic possession, um, oppression, and, and, and basically what the demons will try to do to our, our soul as we try to um, live more of the divine life. But before that, we need to kind of talk a little bit about the Trinity and, and understand what it is that Lucifer, who is now Satan, and the um, angels that once were with him, now demons, once experienced. So to kind of start, we're going we're gonna to walk through the Trinity. 
Um, now, when we, when we speak of God, we usually think, most of the time, we usually think of the Father. If I were to mention God, you might immediately think of the Father, the person, the first person of the Trinity. But when we speak of God, we speak of a Trinity, three persons and one God. Um, so what do we know about God? And, and when I speak of God here, I am speaking of the Trinity. Um, God is eternal. There was never a time when he did not exist. There will never be a time when he doesn't exist. He is eternal. We also know that God is love. And uh, John's letter, uh, the first letter of John, speaks of this. This is also in the Catechism. You can refer to Catechism of the Catholic Church, section 221. And, and this is beautiful how the Catechism actually explains the Trinity. So we have God who is eternal and God who is love. And then the Catechism will say that the Trinity, our God, is an eternal exchange of love. Now when we start breaking this down, eternal exchange of love, we, we can um, ask ourselves a few questions and logically walk through this, that what is necessary for love? If I were to say that I am in love, you might reply, with who? Um, or with whom? And so love um, implies that there is, there is an exchange, and an exchange implies that there are more than one person. So if we, we talk about a lover, if I say I am a lover, you would, you would think that I have a beloved. And so there's a lover that loves the beloved. Now since this is a perfect love, remember, um, God is love, but not just love. He's absolute perfect love, lacking in nothing. So if the lover loves the beloved, and the beloved reciprocates that love, there is a perfect love happening here. That love is so perfect and strong that we call that shared love. Okay, we actually, that, that shared love is so powerful that um, it's actually another person. And so what we have here is we have one person, the lover, who is eternal. If this person, the lover, is eternal, then there, there would never have been a time, all right, that that the beloved would not have existed. If the lover is eternal, then also the beloved is eternal. Um, so we have another person, the second person of the Trinity, who is also eternal. If the, if the beloved at, at some point did not exist, then the lover would not have some another person to love. Um, and so therefore the lover and the beloved are eternal. The shared love also always existed. If you have, if there was always a time that this love was, was happening, then there was always a time that this shared love existed. This shared love is so perfect and eternal and complete that it is also eternal. And it's also a person. Um, even though it's not a perfect analogy, um, probably the best that we can get to understanding the Trinity is actually within a family. If you think of a man as the lover who loves his beloved, a woman, the wife, and the husband and wife have this shared love. This shared love is, is you know, when it is as perfect as it can be in, in a human uh, setting, um, we would, you know, this shared love is so powerful between a man and a woman within marriage that nine months later we give that love, that shared love, a name, right? It's, it's a person. So we can see how powerful it is that when a man loves a woman and a woman loves a man, and, and this love um, is shared between them, it, it begets a person. There's a person there. Now, an example of, of me loving my wife, there was a time, of course, when I didn't even know my wife. So how can I know love what I don't know? Same thing. So, you know, when we speak of a, a husband and a wife, there is a time where the husband and the wife share that love and it brings forth a person. Well, in the Trinity, it's, that's not exactly the case because, remember, this love is always happening, was always happening, will always happen, and therefore, the person of the Holy Trinity, that shared love, is always, will always be there. Um, now, this right here is what we call God. 
It's divinity, divine life. Okay, and that's really what we're looking at here, the divine life. Um, the divine life and communion of the Trinity. What we would say, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when we refer to God, the divine life, the community, right, the Trinity, um, unity and community right there, we're speaking of God, we say we have a personal relationship because we can have a personal relationship because each of the, 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 our, our people, the Father is a person. So I can have a personal relationship with the Father. I can have a personal relationship with the Son and I can have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now the question here is, we're here. This is where we are. I, as I look at myself, I am neither eternal, I'm temporal. There was a time where I was brought into existence. Now I will stay in existence because of God's love. But there, I am not eternal, I am temporal. And I am not always loving. So this divine life, which is this perfect and eternal love, is something that um, I am not naturally a part of. There would have to be something supernatural that would allow me to live and experience this eternal exchange of love. The Catechism in 221 says that, you know, God destines us, God wants us to share in His divine life, which is not just in heaven, but now. He wants us to have this divine life in our soul and to share, to share in this communion, to share in this life, not just a little bit, but as much as possible. Now remember, this love is eternal, so we can always grow and grow and grow, and never, in a sense, come to a, um, a standstill. It, um, it'll always... So how do we get in here? How do we get in here? When this is not natural to us, then it has to be supernatural to us. We have to be given this grace, because there's nothing we can do to get in here. It has to be given to us, and that's exactly what God wants to do. So if, if I want to get into a family, I would have to be maybe adopted into that family. Since I am not naturally in this, I would have to be spiritually born into this. And so we are adopted by the Father. This is our baptism. So we'll stop here just for a second. Anyone who is baptized in a valid baptism um, through the name of Jesus, right, in the name of the Father, actually in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and with water, um, the water purified by Jesus, then that baptism gives them a share by adoption, by a spiritual birth into the divine life. So as soon as we are validly baptized, the divine life floods our soul. And we are now experiencing this exchange of love. We can enter into this exchange of love. We can begin to have a personal relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can grow in love. We can grow in service. We can grow in knowledge. And that is given to us immediately by our baptism. Now, what we believe that this is, in the, in the Catholic Church, we believe that this is strengthened by confirmation. And so now I have the strength, because I need to stay in this, in this divine life. There are many things, and we'll talk about this in just a second at the end of the lesson, there are many um, demons and Satan himself that want to pull us away from this divine life. And there are many other um, decoys, you know, false life, you know, false things out there that try to offer us um, a false love um, and, and, a, and a selfishness that pull us away from this. So the confirmation helps us to strengthen this grace that we need. Just because I'm adopted into a family doesn't mean I don't want to run away sometimes. Maybe I'm adopted into the family, the family treats me as one, but I don't want to be a part of that family. And this is also true of the spiritual life. Even though we have been given the divine life, we can still reject it. We can still walk away. Now, another way we can be into a family is through marriage. And this is what's really remarkable, because we see all through the Old Testament, and this is something that the Jewish people believed, that God, the Creator, would marry his creation, that he would uh, not, it wasn't just that I will be your God and you will be my people, but that I will marry my people. The builder, right, will come to marry his, his, his people. Um, now, how will this happen? How, how in the wisdom of God will God do this? 
How will God come and marry his people? Well, he will have to become flesh. And so when Jesus, the Word, okay, the second person of the Trinity, takes on flesh, why is it that he has to take on flesh? Why is that flesh so important? Well, he wants to be able to unite with his bride. And so that the two, the bride and the groom, who is Jesus Christ, will become one flesh. And there is no greater love, of course, than a groom, for a groom, to lay down his life for the bride. To lay down your life, you would have to have flesh. You would have to have a body to be willing to lay down. And that's exactly what the second person of the Trinity does. Takes on flesh. And so when Jesus Christ, okay, Jesus is our groom. And the church, he founds a church. He actually founds an institution in which we can be brought into by our baptism, strengthened by our confirmation, we become the bride. He takes on flesh so that he can become one flesh with us and that he can lay down, proving his love for us, lay down his life, um, be, be willing to have his flesh nailed to the cross. And then he also, because he becomes flesh, he can actually give us his flesh. And this is the Eucharist. So we see here, through the, bapt through the sacraments of what we call the sacraments of initiation, baptism, strengthened by confirmation, and crowned with the Blessed Sacrament, the Eucharist, through the these three sacraments, we are invited into, we are given the grace necessary to be a part of this divine life. The stronger we connect to these sacraments, the more we live out our baptismal vows of rejecting Satan, his empty promises, his evil works, the more we avoid evil and pursue good and, and, and have that relationship with our Father, you know, praying the Our Father and taking that adoption spiritually, spirit, uh, seriously, the more we will share in the divine life. The more we are open to the activity of the Holy Spirit and aware of the activity of Spirit in our life, the more we will share in this divine life. And the closer we get to Jesus Christ, in knowledge and love and service and the Eucharist and the sacraments and, and all of these things, the more we share in this divine life. We have not been only given the opportunity to share in the divine life, but we have been given every tool necessary to share and increase this divine life within our soul. Um, so, so that being said, this divine life, we are destined to be a part of that. This is God's will for us. Is this divine life only for us? Now, we do know that at one point, this, this uh, Trinity, right, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this community was only shared for all eternity. It was shared by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But as we know, anything that we love, and this is an eternal exchange of love, anytime we have something that is truly lovable, if I love if I get a new car and I love that new car, I want to share. I want someone to ride in that car with me. If I have a, a new outfit, you know, I may want to um, show that off. Um, if I have a new house, I want to invite my friends over to the house. So anytime there's something that we love or even someone that we love, we want to share that. The same is obviously true of, of God. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit wanted to share this love with the angels. And so the angels were created. And there was this sharing that the angels were able to be a part of this divine life, to share in this exchange of love. But in this love, there was another plan as well. God wanted to create humans. And so we don't know exactly the details of this. Fulton Sheen tells us a little bit. But, but the idea is that God the Father had revealed, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit revealed to the angels who were the first people, the first spirits, I should say. They were spirits without a soul. They were sharing in this trinity. And it was revealed to all the angels. Okay, you can imagine, you know, the, the Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit revealing to all of the angels that there would be another group, the humans, that would be able to share in this trinity. But there was a problem. The humans had a body, and so they would have to have a way to share in this trinity. And it was revealed to them that the second person would become man. 
would take on flesh, and that God, pure spirit, would take on flesh, that that flesh would be knit in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and, and that humans also would be able to share in this divine life. Well, at that moment, Fulton Sheen especially reflects that, there was one of the angels, Lucifer, who is called the angel of light, right, the light bearer, that Lucifer said, I will not serve. I will not serve, and I will not love. Because when he chose to, to not serve this plan, that was an unloving choice. That was a choice to say, I do not want a part of this eternal exchange of love. So with his decision not to serve and not to love, he can no longer experience this eternal exchange of love. His choice was unloving, and he, and he chose to, to choose his own thing. Instead of focusing on God and, and, and his love and service, he turned inward, and he chose his own place. At that moment, he chose something other than the divine life. He chose his own place. Now it says that Lucifer and a third of the angels were cast out. Okay? They were cast out of this divine life. And, and in, all, in all honesty, they couldn't be a part of this because they were not willing to enter into this exchange of love. If they weren't able to enter into this exchange of love, God is not going to force that upon them. And so they choose their own place. And it says, and in Luke, this is Luke 10, if you want to look this up, Luke 10, 18, Jesus actually says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Because remember, when this all took place, the battle of heaven, um, the, the second person of, of the Trinity, Jesus, who was the Word but not yet made flesh, um, saw this all happen. Witness Lucifer and a third of the angels falling like lightning from heaven. And so now they are on earth, and it says in scripture that they prowl throughout the earth seeking the ruin of souls. So let's think about that. Why do they want then to prevent us? Um, they want to keep our souls from participating in the divine life. And, and there's probably, if, you, if we really think about that, there's probably a lot of reasons why they wouldn't want us as humans to um, experience the divine life. One, they are not experiencing it, so misery loves company. Um, they, they are still rebelling because their choice is an eternal choice. It's important to realize that the, the choice that they were given to either share in this or not is an eternal choice. Once they make that choice, it's final. And so they are still living out their choice to reject the plan of God, to not serve and to not love. When they made that choice, it was an eternal choice that they cannot turn back on, and they knowingly do not want to turn back on. So they are still roaming around, not loving and not serving God's divine plan. What is God's divine plan? For us, our soul, to experience the divine life. Their mission is still the same as it was you know, at that time, to, to reject the plan of God. And so... Now I really want to get into um, setting all that up. Now I want to get into the gospel that we have today. Um, we, we clearly have a demon that uh, has a conversation with our Lord. Um, so the demon cries out, what have, you do, what, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Yes, he has come to destroy you. And, and he will destroy you through the crucifixion. Um, I know who you are. The demon says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One. Now, the demon here reveals to us something very important. That the demons know Jesus Christ. And they know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Um, they know that He's the Holy One. Now, you know, another thing that we're taught in the Catechism, and this is something that we should all know, is that the, why are we here? What's the purpose of our life? Is to know and to love and to serve God. We see in this Gospel that even the demons know Jesus Christ is Lord. They even know that, and, and the demon himself says this. Lucifer, who is Satan, 
obviously knows Jesus Christ as Lord. The knowledge is there, but is it enough to know? Is it enough to know that Jesus is Lord? We have to also be willing to serve and love. The demons know Jesus, but they refuse to serve and love him. So that, that's an important for us to know that. Um, so this encounter is, Jesus then rebukes him and says, quiet, come out of him. This is important too because the demon has to obey Jesus. Jesus has the authority, authority that no one had ever seen. Why does he have the authority? Because he is God himself. And God has the ultimate authority over everything that he has created, over humans and over angels. Now, these angels that have fallen are called the demons. And Lucifer, who has fallen, is called Satan. So we want to talk about this a little bit. Why are Satan and the demons, what is their um, plan to keep us? Well, there's a few things that we can talk about. One is, you know, how do they attack us? How do they try to keep our soul from living the divine life? Well, one is through possession. Second is through oppression. And the third is through temptation. I just want to talk about these three. I'm sure there's other ways. But I do want to kind of clarify these, these three at the end of this lesson. And that is possession. What do we mean by possession? Well, possession is, is from inside. This is when a demon, one of these fallen, that hate our souls and, and hate the divine life and want nothing to do with the divine life and want nothing for us to do with the divine life, it's when they come from inside and, and, and take control of our body, right? Um, and this is what we have in this gospel, is we have an example of possession. And the only way that this demon can be cast out is by the authority of Jesus Christ. This is also the same thing. When someone truly is possessed, um, and when we see this in movies, you know, Hollywood knows very well. Who do they call in the movies? Do they call um, the non-denominational pastor? Do they call First Baptist, um, you know, uh, the pastor at First Baptist? It, always, consistently, when there is possession, we see that it is a Catholic priest that is called. That there is some type of connection that we know that the authority that has the, uh, the power and the authority to drive out demons is the Catholic Church. Why does the Catholic Church have that authority? Because Jesus Christ actually gave that authority to the apostles, and the apostles have passed that authority on to the current bishop um, in that diocese, and the bishops all over the diocese. So when there is a true case of possession, what would happen at a parish is that the person that feels possessed, um, that, that thinks they're possessed, would maybe make that known to someone in the church, make, make it known to the pastor, and the pastor would uh, talk to this person. If the pastor believes this person to be possessed, they would let the, the, the bishop know. And, and the bishop would contact the exorcist. Or, there is an exorcist. Um, Hollywood knows who to call when, when, there, when someone is possessed. You call a Catholic priest. You call the church because the church actually has the authority then to, to drive out that demon, just as we see in the gospel. Um, we have another um, you know, section here called you know, oppression. So if someone is not, has a demon from the inside and they're not possessed, then what we see more common is, is um, oppression. And with possession, you know, where there's so many different uh, things that we, we have guards against this, but uh, with oppression, what we have is actually the demons kind of coming from outside, you know, pushing down almost in a sense, um, trying to keep our souls from the divine life or even take the, the divine life from us. And, and this would, would come to just a real uh, pressure, maybe a despair or a doubt. And, um, and with that, it's very important for us to know that we, through our baptism, um, through, our, through this divine life, we have the power in Jesus Christ to, to drive out or exercise those demons that are oppressing us. Um, one example that's happened in my life was, um, and of course Satan wants to attack what's most dear to you, and so in my life he was attacking my vocation of marriage, trying to uh, put a doubt in my mind that at one, I had chosen the wrong vocation, that maybe I wasn't supposed to be married, but two, trying to also put a doubt in my mind that I chose the right person. And so with that, I remember one night just laying on the couch, I remember I grabbed my scapular, and on my scapular there's a crucifix and also a Benedict medal, and I grabbed that and I just kept holding on to that because that's that sacramental has power 
it's the crucifix, it's the Benedict medal, it's, it's the, the arms of Mary, as we say, the scapular is. And I remember looking up at a crucifix that was on our wall in our living room, and I remember just saying over and over the holy name of Jesus. I just said, Jesus, Jesus. And I said, I said to the demon, I said, in the name of Jesus, be gone. In the name of Jesus, be gone. And, and truly, after, after staying uh, strong in that for a while, then, then basically that demon had to leave. In the name of Jesus, that, that demon had to leave. We see the same exact um, um, result as we do in the gospel, that at the name of Jesus, through the authority of Jesus, a demon cannot stay around. Um, you know, we have so many different protections that, that, that we know that we can go to confession. And a confession, um, our, our, our associate pastor here, Father Molman, said that one confession is, is as powerful as an exorcism. Um, and so when we feel like, you know, we're having that pressure of the demon's heavy temptation, even oppression, go to confession, go to Mass, receive the Eucharist, and, and, and make sure that we are staying close to, to holy things, and we are in communion with holy people, um, mostly in communion with, with um, the divine life, the, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We also know that if we ever lose the state of grace, if we fall out of that state of grace, and we lose, lose communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we need to immediately go to confession because we become susceptible to um, Satan and, and all of his, his evil ways. Um, I'm not sure if before on the video that I had mentioned Psalm 91, but this is very powerful. It's the psalm that actually Jesus uh, quoted when he was being tempted in the desert. And this is prayed, I believe, each night, either on Saturday or Sunday night in night prayer. Um, but we have so many things at our aid. Uh, what we need to do is we need to stay close to Christ, who is the victor. We need to stay close to Our Lady of Victory, Mar Mary. Stay close to the church. Stay, of course, close to these sacraments of initiation. When we fall out of grace, immediately go to confession and be brought back into reconciliation through that sacrament. Um, I just want to finish with, with saying that we have to be aggressive in this battle. Um, we have to fight for this divine life. We have to want that with all of our soul, to know, love, and serve God. It is not enough, as the demons do, just to know Him, but we have to be willing to serve and love. We do not want to find ourselves in the same camp of saying, I will not serve and I will not love. Instead, we want to say, Jesus, I will love you, I will serve you, and I will know you, and I want to now in my life, and I want to forevermore. And we have to be uh, very aggressive with this. One time there was a priest that was baptizing. Uh, he happened to baptize 20 children in one day. And, and he said after, um, you know, gosh, are you tired? How do you feel, Father? He said, I just spit in the devil's eye 20 times today. And I think we have to be willing to, to um, cooperate with this victory in Christ, uh, Christ and, and Our Lady and the Church, and be willing to fight for the divine life and make sure other people, not only ourselves, our own soul, experiences this, but as many souls as possible experience the divine life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.